Amen. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 7. The Gospel of John chapter 7. Y'all don't know how hurt I was to find out that the drummer boy wasn't at the manger scene. Did y'all know? He wasn't there. He's a made-up character in the manger scene. He was that character that they made up to give that one kid who didn't have a role in the manger scene. It was that, it was that uh, he wasn't there. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. See, most of y'all are having a Merry Christmas, amen? amen. How many of y'all need an extra touch from Jesus, though? Amen. Quite a few of you. The Lord can do it. Amen. This is what happened in the days of Jesus. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that every believer here who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and have that Spirit dwell in them, and they are now a living son or daughter of God. Thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, may that Spirit move my flesh aside right now, Lord, that the very Spirit of God would minister to every heart and mind here, that no one may leave here unchanged. But Lord, let yourself be revealed to us, Lord, that we may know how we ought to live. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, Amen and amen. I find scriptures like this beautiful and awesome because we let, it lets us know that Jesus has a family here and they have some siblings and not all of them were buying what he was saying. Uh, how many of y'all got siblings out there? Any siblings? Amen. You got, got some brothers and sisters if you grew up in a big family. Some of you were not blessed or some of say not cursed by having brothers and sisters. Amen. But uh, many of us are blessed with this thing called family, which is uh, a beautiful gift from God. But it lets us know that Jesus suffered and went through anything that we'd ever go through. As it says in the, uh, the letter of Hebrews, that he was born and shaped, and he would go through everything that you and I would go through, except he remained what? Sinless. He became that high priest, that sacrifice, that only he could have taken away our sin because he was blameless. But we all stand here. Uh, someone, one of our members emailed me a while back about uh, his, how he treated his sister, which was really, I, some of them were awesome. I can't share all of them because uh, I don't want him to get in trouble. But he told me uh, this one time he put his sister in a, one of those big tires and he pushed it down a hill. Now the only problem with this was that is they lived on a, a major highway. And so it was barreling down this road. Amen. God protected. Amen. And it re made me recall of the things that I went through with my brothers and sisters. How many of y'all eat like this? Any of y'all eat like this? You either eat like that because you spent some time in the slammer, or you have siblings. That's the only reasons why anybody would eat like this. Because uh, when we sat at the table, I sat right beside my brother Brian, and he would mess with my food every time. He would do something with it. When we were praying, that's when he would act. When you're praying, that's when the devil's working, people. All right? But the Lord, he is good. He is much stronger than the enemy. Amen? 
And one time my brother, he made me a sandwich, and I knew something was off because he never did anything for me. He's like, Chris, you hungry, man? I'll make you a sandwich. I was like, sure. And so he sat there, and he brought me this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I, he sat there and watched me eat it. And in my seven-year-old self, I have no clue. I was like, why is he being so nice? This is wonderful, you know? And when I finished, he's like, so, how was that cricket? Now, I don't know if he really put one in there or not. But if he did, it was really good. Because uh, I sure didn't even know it, you know? But we're, we're, that sibling rivalry there, you know? And, and just to think that Jesus and his family dynamic, uh, you see, God chose to send his son through the pinnacle of his creation. And you say, what is the pinnacle of his creation? Well, that is created man and woman coming together and having a family. He sent his son through the pinnacle of his creation. He brought Adam and Eve together. And he brings us, even this day, in marriage. Because outside of his created order and his gift of marriage, nothing else can bring forth future or life. Between a man and a woman in marriage comes future and life. And he chose the pinnacle of his creation to bring forth Jesus. And this is the family structure he had. He had, I believe that Mary and Joseph were awesome parents. I mean, if you could pick your parents, I mean, wouldn't they be awesome people? Like, if, if the God of the universe picked his parents, surely they would be faithful. And scriptures reveal that. We, we find Mary, when the angel comes to Mary, he said, blessed are you, favored one. And she says, why am I favored? And he says, because you are going to have the son who's going to take the sins away from the world. But she asked one question, how can this be? Because I've never known a man. And the angel said, you will be overshadowed. And you will bear a son. And you know what she then said? Here's your servant. What faith? But you see, I believe that Joseph had a little bit more faith than Mary. I think he had a little bit more faith than Mary. Because Mary, his betrothed, comes to him and says, listen... I'm with child, but it's from God. It's not from another man. How many men would actually look at her as like, oh, okay, I'll buy that, right? I mean, this sounds so far-fetched. And listen, at first, Joseph didn't believe it. He couldn't believe it, and his heart was broken. He decided, though, because he's a good, gentle, loving man, faithful man, he was going to put her away, what? Quietly. So she wouldn't be shamed. And protect her because the law was steep in this. But when he was going to do it, he had a dream. An angel of the Lord came to him and said, Joseph, the child she is bearing, will, bring, will take the sins away from the world. His name will be Jesus. And he is Emmanuel, God with us. And listen, when he woke from that dream, he didn't think that it was just something bad he ate the, the night before. When he woke from that dream, he knew that God had spoken to him and he was going to be an awesome and faithful man to this woman and bear the Lord's child. And it says at the end of Matthew chapter 1 that he did not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus. That means that he didn't consummate the marriage until after Jesus was born. And from that, we know that Jesus had siblings. Do you know, it says in uh, Matthew chapter 13, it tells us some names of his siblings, which is very interesting. Uh, listen to this with me. You just listen to me as I read it. It says um, in, in Matthew 13, verse 54, it says, He came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue, and they were astounded. Where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Is not his brothers called James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Very good Jewish names, guys. And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him because Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house. Jesus not only had four brothers, gives us his name, but he had some sisters. And we know that Joseph and Mary probably did grow. And could you just imagine being the sibling of Jesus? Could you imagine if you got favoritism in your family right now? Could you imagine being the sibling of Jesus? It's like, oh, here comes the golden child, right? <laughs> oh, Jesus never does anything wrong, does he, mom and dad, right? 
And for the most part, I believe that Joseph and Mary didn't have many troubles with Jesus. It's said for this one event when they went to uh, Passover when Jesus was about 12. Do you all remember this? And kids, they're, they're so amazing because they'll just do what they want. And then the parents have to pay for it sometimes, right? Amen. They still do that today. And so they were about a day's journey from Jerusalem. And they realized that Jesus is not with their traveling party. I mean, how bad do you think Joseph felt? I mean, how did he even pray going there? I mean, what was he going to say? Lord, I'm sorry I lost you? Right? He was entrusted with God's Son. They get to Jerusalem, they look three days for him. And they finally found him where? In the temple. And then he said something smart to him, right? You've ever seen your kids, but it wasn't smart. He's just telling the, telling the truth. Wouldn't you know I would be in my father's house? Amen. Jesus grew up in a very loving home. He was given a very beautiful family. Matter of fact, his family cared for him so much when he was actually out in the ministry doing many amazing things. Rumors started going around, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells a story, and specifically Mark, it says that his family goes to restrain him because they heard rumors that he had lost his mind. And so they get to this house, and there's so many people crammed into this house, they can't get to him. And so they did that word of mouth thing. It was like, hey, tell Jesus, his mom and his brothers and his sisters, we're here for him. We're going to take him home. And so word gets back to Jesus. He's in the middle of his house teaching. And so what do you do when your parents are outside? He looks at Elden and it's like, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Only those who do the will of the Lord. Those are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. Now, Jesus wasn't slighting his family. He wasn't dismissing them, and he wasn't moving them out of his life. Jesus gives us a really a picture of, I believe, of what we would call the family of God. See, Jesus not only had earthly family, we are his family, purchased in blood. That you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is a great, great gift. Because listen, some of us, just because you have a family, does not mean that you have experienced the love of a family. Amen? See, the love of a church family sometimes may even seem greater than your own family. But here is the difference, and that's God's love. That's the difference. You see, we're all called to be family to one another. We're all called to love one another as he loved us. And sometimes the greatest gift God's given us is family. Sometimes it goes awry, doesn't it? But here we are near Christmas where who will be gathering Families. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't know the condition of everyone's family, but God's leading me to give you all some tips on how to get through the holidays with your families. And more importantly, how to love them like Jesus loves them. So, uh, my fellas, do I have my fellas here this morning? Oh, come on now, guys. Are you with me or not? Amen. Well, repeat after me. Am I a good brother? Ladies, are you with me? There we go. All right, ladies, are you ready? Say, am I a good sister? Are we peacemakers or are we fire starters? Amen. Let's look at the scripture, though. It says in the first two verses here, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to what? Kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. We'll, we'll stop right there. So we have this big event coming up. Jesus, he couldn't go in the public in Judea or near Jerusalem, because just not too long ago, he healed a cripple on the Sabbath. And although they were mad that he healed on the Sabbath, what they were more mad at was that he looked at the guy and said, your sins are forgiven. You see, Jesus' teaching would place himself equal with God. Jesus told them that he and the Father was one. And that infuriated them. They saw that as blasphemy. They wanted Jesus dead. And so Jesus, there was a certain time that everything had to take place. He was hanging back, for the most part, just going in the outskirts, ministering. And this was during the time of tabernacles or booths. Now, this is a really cool holiday. It's when all the Jews would, would fashion tabernacles or booths out of branches. 
and they would kind of live under them for a certain amount of time celebrating, uh, they are remembering the 40 years in the wilderness. They journeyed and traveled, and they're kind of celebrating that. It happens five days after the Day of Atonement, which the high priest would come in and sacrifice in the temple and uh, basically offer remission of sins to the entire nation for that year. That's what they would do. And this was a great time that all the family would come together. And Jesus' brothers, like Jesus, everybody's going to be there. Why don't you come on out there? And, and it's, it's a celebration, sort of like Thanksgiving and Christmas, when all the family comes together. Now listen, when families get together, it can be something that is very awesome and beautiful and, and just touching. Or it can be an utter train wreck sometimes, filled with conflict, and, and sometimes it'll end in an argument. Uh, like, I, I recently read a story of a lady named Diane and her younger sister named Kim, and they had three sisters. The middle sister was telling this story, and she said every year they would swap and take turns of who was going to have the dinner. And so uh, as they, they would meet, their oldest sister, Diane, she had a certain way about her. Everything had to be a certain way. And so when she would uh, uh, go to the dinner, she would move everything a certain way. Even if the sisters had already placed it where they wanted it, they would move it just in a certain way they wanted Oh, well, she wanted it. And so it was Kim's turn to host the dinner. And Diane was very oppressive sometimes on her and uh, would criticize everything, especially how she cooked. Now listen, fellas, listen up. Uh, n don't ever do that to your wife. Don't crack on her cooking, all right? She's feeding you, all right? Don't crack on it. And do not ever say, well, that's not how mama did it. Don't ever say that. Just a tip, right? And so as they're serving the turkey, Diane takes it upon herself to cut the turkey. Now, Diane was complaining from the moment she came in. It was raining. She's complaining about the rain. She's complaining about her kids. She was complaining about having to travel to be there. Now she's complaining about the turkey. And she says, Kim, this turkey is too dry. Kim snatched that knife out of her hand, this quiet, meek woman, and she stabbed that turkey. She snatched that turkey up, went to the front door, opened it, and flung it out into the rain. And she looked at Diane. She said, Diane, is it wet enough now? Why don't you eat dinner outside? And like, everybody was like, <clears throat> they didn't have turkey that year. Right? And matter of fact, that's like the worst thing you can do to a turkey. Man, that's awful. And that's how family can be sometimes. You see, family it shouldn't be like that. But I want to tell you what makes the difference. What makes the difference is what you bring with you to that party. Amen. And I'm talking about your attitude. It will make an entire difference what you bring with you. What kind of attitude do you carry? And you might be sitting there like, because every family has somebody who's a, a, a fire starter. They're a drama. And you might be sitting there like, well, my family doesn't have that because it might be you. <laughs> you might be that fire starter. Every family has one. So listen, before you ever enter into a family engagement, Christians, you got to be prayed up. Because you want a sweet spirit. Listen, when we spend time with Jesus, we can look and act like Jesus. Amen? We also would be a very good idea to listen. Not only listen to others, but listen to Jesus to give you the right moment to say the right words. We must bring encouragement with us. And, and please, please, please bring Jesus with you wherever you go. But you see, you might be saying, Pastor Chris, that's the problem. I bring Jesus and my family gets upset because I love Jesus. Well, I would say let them be upset. Share Jesus. Love just like He loves. Pray like He prays. And show them that God is alive in your life. Amen? And Jesus, He showed His brothers that God was alive. He, he tried to. Look at verse 3 and 5. Because they said to Him, His brothers therefore said to Him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one who does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. 
For his brothers didn't what? They didn't believe in Jesus. I have a pastor friend. We, we took a trip a few years ago. Uh, and we did, went to a pastor's conference. While we were there, he kind of shared with me his own salvation story. You see, he was a drop-dead alcoholic. And the one person who would always rescue him, be there for him, pray over him, get help for him, was his brother, his older brother. Now, his older brother was a pastor as well. And so his older brother was always looking out for him, would always minister to him, would always preach the gospel to him. And the little brother was just like, listen, man, I've heard it. I don't want to hear it. But the Holy Spirit conviction was on his heart until finally he gave in and he took that addiction away. He got his life right. And then he felt the call into ministry. And so he, he accepted the call and was, was pastoring a church when his brother lost his church. You see drama and conflict happen there. The church split. And so the, the man lost his church. And then he lost his wife. And then he lost his call. And you know what he turned to? Alcohol. So it was a complete reversal. The young brother who was saved by the older brother is now desperately praying for his older brother who is just living in a destitute way. And he says, Chris, every time I try to bring up Jesus to him, he just has this, such a heart that's so hardened and cold. What do you do with family who are lost or who have walked away from Jesus? What do you do with family like that? Well, let me first by saying, let's talk about what not to do. The first thing we should not do is continually argue with them. That will not bring glory to God. And you're not going to win this argument because whatever decisions they've made, it's hardened on their heart. The only person who could ever crack that is the Holy Spirit. So you need to pray for him. The second thing that we must not do is guilt tactics. Have you all ever heard this from your mom before? Oh, have you forgot you have a mother? Have you ever heard that? Some of your moms are here. What we can fall into the trap of is trying to guilt somebody and to do what we want. That's not Jesus. We can't shame them into coming back to the church. And I wouldn't suggest cut them off. Because listen, who uses guilt, shame, and unforgiveness against God's children? The enemy. So why should we treat our children that way? Amen. Amen. See, Jesus, he teaches us in Matthew 5, 43 through 45, that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who what? Persecute us. If Jesus asked us to love our enemies, how much more should we love our family? It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, it says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they thirst, give them something to drink. If Jesus wants us to feed our, our enemies, how much more should we feed our families? Amen. Sometimes it works the other way around, though. A, a dad, his daughter just got out of college, a really great degree. She could do anything that she wanted to in this field. And she said, Dad, God's calling me into missions. And the dad at first was like, didn't know how to feel, but then he started getting angry about it. Because not too long ago, they'd lost their son. And now he felt like, oh, well, now you're going to take my daughter now? God, is that what you're going to do? And so he got very angry. And so it caused like this really awkwardness in the family at any event or anything, because he would constantly bring it up. Oh, you're really going to do that? You're really, you could have this and this and this. And she would say, Dad, I just have to obey Jesus, what he's telling me. And so the pastor who's telling me this story was, this is his church family. And so they came to him for counseling. And the father ends up getting mad at the pastor because the pastor said, you must obey Jesus. I didn't come to hear that. I came for you to tell my daughter that she's being foolish. But you see, it was a really sweet service when she had received a call to missions. And her daddy, he did the prayer over her. And he put his hands on her. And he said, God, you gave her to me. Now I give her back to you. Because she was never mine. She's always been yours. 
Use her, Father. Use her. What an awesome problem to have that. Amen. For those who walk away, who've turned away, pray and love them. Pray and love them. That's all we can do at times. See, Jesus, don't you think he loved his brothers? That's why this passage really tugs at my heart. Look at these last two verses. It says, Then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always, or in some translations it says, always here or, here or right now. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are what? Evil. Uh, Christians, if they only knew how much Jesus loved them, if we would only know how much Jesus loves us. Jesus, who would be willing to give it all. You see, our time is right now. Our time is now. Jesus has ascended, and this is now the church's time. It is our time to minister. It is our time to preach. It is our time to share Christ's love and tell everybody about it. But there are some things that prevent us from doing that, and it's the very things that disrupt us as a family. And I, I want to end by giving you some of these things that disrupt family and disrupt churches. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. I was reading a book called Re Releasing the Revival Flood. And he said that, that this is what stops it from being our time. We must do away with angry attitudes, buried bitterness, and false forgiveness. Those things need to go. Because number one, loving God means loving one another. You cannot say that you love God whom you cannot see and hate someone that you, or and say you hate someone that you see. You see, God, He is, we can't see Him, but He loves us. We must be about that same love. Love means loving others and God. Uh, we also need to know what God hates. Often we talk about what God loves, but I want to tell you what, what God hates. That's very important too. And you say, uh, Pastor Chris, God hates? It's like, yeah, He hates sin. He hates it a great bit. It says in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19, it says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him, Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that hurry to run to evil, a lying witness who testifies falsely. And this is the seventh one, which is the worst he, uh, by this prophecy. It says, one who sows discord in a family. God does not like when his family or his churches are torn apart by discord. Because God is a God of unity, peace, and love. You see, the very gospel in which we proclaim is all about love and forgiveness. And so listen, if we are about love and forgiveness, how can we withhold these very things? That's as if we want the world to be like us, but we want to live as the world. How can we as Christians ask somebody who doesn't believe in Christ to live as us when we think and do and act just like them? It, you won't, you won't ever get any further than that. The very gospel that we love and cling to is founded on love and forgiveness. You see, the greatest gift that you and I could ever give to another person is what Jesus gave to you. And that is another chance. You get another chance with Jesus. And I do have good news. Jesus' brothers, they believed. They came to know Him who he was. You say, how do we know this, Pastor Chris? It's in the New Testament. You see, James and Judas both wrote letters in the New Testament. James wrote the letter of James. Ju uh, Judas wrote the letter of Jude. It's right before Revelation. Check it out. It's cool. But this is really awesome. James became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He's mentioned in the book of Acts. Don't give up on your family. They're a gift. They really are. 
And you say, well, Pastor Chris, you don't know my family. You're right, but God does. He knows them. And this is the time of year when you will be around the most people. Our first mission field, our family. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, take away our angry attitudes. Take away our buried bitterness. And take away any false forgiveness, Lord. That we may stand and be genuine before you and before others. And God, that you would use us this Christmas and this new year to gain new ground for Jesus with our families. God, that we may show them that you are a living God and that you love them. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.